Okay, we're gonna get started. Yeah, okay. No music, sorry about that, but I am talking. I don't know if you can hear me. Anybody? Okay. All right. I don't know how to make this work, so stand by. Okay, try that. Better, okay, so um, we have had a bit of a hiccup in the grading, so I'm sorry your scores are not gonna be posted today. Um, they'll be posted probably re most realistically uh, next week. The good news for you is that the hiccup was that the grading was um, too harsh, so I'm gonna go back and uh, regrade them all myself. Um, uh, but that will take me a long time. So therefore, <laughs> it will, uh, you know, the outcome should be better for you um, and will probably uh, remove the need for you to ask for a regrade, but it's gonna take me all week to do it. So um, next week, um, hopefully then they'll be still returned in your sections um, for Erica sections uh, next Monday. Okay, so now here's where we left off, um, talking about some of the causes for uh, mood disorders. Um, uh, so we talked a little, some about neurobiology and genetics, um, and now let's talk a little bit about some social factors for depression, um, and then also for uh, mania. So uh, some triggers for uh, depression. Um, so stressful life events. Um, this may seem commonsensical to you, but between half, almost half, and two thirds of people who have an episode of major depressive disorder report experiencing a stressful life event prior to the onset of their depression. Now. This is um, true if anybody is depressed, though, if you remember reading the book, there tends to be a bias towards remembering things negatively. So you may be thinking, well, if somebody's currently depressed and you say, well, there's something bad happened just before the onset of depression, since everything is colored through a lens of uh, just a lot of negative feelings, people may say, yes, something bad happened. But even when this is um, the case that stressful life events precede the onset of depression, when done with the state-of-the-art best case uh, measure of stressful life events, if you remember way back when, um, uh, when we talked about the LEDs, remember the life events and difficulty schedule, that's a structured interview where you walk people through very carefully the events that have happened to them in their life. Um, using a good measure like a LEDs, we find that uh, as many as two-thirds of people report having a, a stressful life event prior to the onset of depression. Um, so carefully done, not filtered by somebody's um, overall negativity when currently depressed, we still see that uh, stressful life events can precede the onset of depression. Uh, other interpersonal factors, um, rejection by others, and the book talks a little bit about this, there's some work by um, Jim Coyne, Tom Joyner, and others that uh, show that people with depression are particularly sensitive to the rejection of other people, but it turns into a bit of a vicious uh, cycle, such that if people are feeling down and depressed, they, they don't want to be around other people, um, and uh, they therefore kind of isolate themselves a little bit, don't seek out uh, other people, and then that can get kind of turned to feel uh, like uh, they're rejected uh, by other people. Well, nobody wants to be around me anyway, um, you know, I'm kind of, you know, not very fun to be around, nobody wants to be around me, nobody uh, thinks I'm worth being around, uh, they wouldn't want me to be around uh, uh, anyway. Um, and so um, what happens in the, in the work of Tom Joyner, he shows though, that a lot of people with depression also then will seek reassurance from other people. So I know I'm not very good mood, I don't really feel like hanging out, you probably don't want to be around me anyway, do you? Oh no, we want you to, you know, come on, you know, it's gonna be fun, you should come, really, it's gonna be fun. Oh, I don't really feel like it, plus you guys don't really want me to be around anyway. No, we really do, it's gonna be fun, it's a group, you know, you should come, it'll be good, you know, it's really, you know, it's pretty casual, you know, oh, but I just feel loud, I don't really feel like going. You sure you guys really want me to be around? Well, okay, if you don't feel like going, just don't go. You know, so people, you know, uh, you get exhausted uh, by, you know, you initially, you know, try to provide reassurance, but eventually, um, you know, there's only so many times you can say, yeah, yeah, we want you to come, you know, come on, you can only provide so much reassurance before you kind of don't know what else to say. And so then people are like, well, if you want to go, that's cool, you know, you can just, you know, chill, that's fine, whatever, I'll be, you know, it's cool. Oh, we, you don't really want to be going anyway. No, we want you to go. Uh, really, we do. You should come. No, I'm really, okay, fine, stay. You know, like, so as a friend, you don't know what to do. You're trying to be, you know, supportive. Well, if you feel bad, you know, just, you know, hang out. That's cool. You know, you can do, do this next time. Uh, oh, well, you guys don't really want me to go to another person. No, we want you to. So you see that battle. That, um, so that can turn into a bit of a vicious cycle here. The reassurance seeking and no amount of reassurance helps someone who is feeling depressed, um, but they're really wanted by other people. Part because why? Because part of those symptoms um, uh, of feeling worthless about yourself and feeling, you know, down and irritable um, and uh, maybe feeling guilty. Well, you know, I'm kind of, the, you know, nobody wants me around anyway. Remember last time I hung out and nobody really, you know, thought I was very much fun. So, I'm, you know, you know. So there is this complicated set of cognitive symptoms associated with depression. Um, people can kind of talk themselves into thinking they're not really wanted by others. They may seek reassurance. They get it, but it's not really all that reassuring. So they seek it again. They get it. Still not reassuring. They seek it again and they don't get it and then they feel rejected. Um, so. Uh, that you know, is not a uh, particularly good combination of interpersonal factors, um, and that can contribute at least to exacerbate or maintain depression. Uh, low social support, not having a very big social support network, not having a lot of friends or family or other people, all of that is a potential trigger risk factor for uh, depression. Um, so the fewer people in a social network, particularly close to others, um, is associated with uh, an increased risk of depression. What about some emotional factors? Um, so depression is almost by definition an emotional disorder. Remember, you have to have at least sad mood or anhedonia, which is really a, a loss of interest or pleasure, a positive emotion, um, to either, uh, and then four other symptoms. But you know, the quintessential kind of gatekeeper symptom for depression is either sad mood, sad emotion, or a lack of pleasure or positive emotion. Um, and so um, one of the, uh, a lot of uh, research studies have um, characterized um, their two broad factors of emotion um, that characterize people with depression, which are very synonymous with what I just said the symptoms are. So high negative affect, this is a trait measure of negative affectivity. People with depression will score high on negative affect, meaning that they feel not only uh, sadness, but they feel a lot of anxiety, a lot of nervousness, a lot of uh, boredom, a lot of uh, irritation, all sorts of negative emotions. That's high negative affect. But people with anxiety also experience a lot of high negative affect. People with anxiety also feel a lot of anxious and irritable and anger and nervousness. That's also very similar to anxiety. So what distinguishes from an emotion profile anyway, depression from anxiety really is low positive affect. Um, so people with depression not only feel high, a lot of uh, negative affect, they feel very little positive affect. They don't feel very much enthusiasm, very much joy, very much excitement, very much happiness, very much um, uh, contentment. Very, you know, any of positive emotions, they don't feel very much of those. Very, very low level. Whereas that's not the case with a lot of the anxiety disorders anyway. Here, people with anxiety disorders, with panic and anxiety disorder, they feel a lot of negative affect, a lot of anxiety, irritability, anger, nervousness. But they feel <coughs> positive affect. There's not really a low level of that whatsoever. In general, in life, they feel a good amount of excitement, enthusiasm, joy, happiness. Uh, they're, they're really indistinguishable from people who don't have anxiety disorders. So this low positive affect is what really distinguishes anxiety from depression. And another thing that, that distinguishes anxiety is what's called anxious arousal. So the kind of feelings in your body. I feel jittery, I feel on edge, I feel keyed up, I feel activated. Those sorts of bodily states of emotions is what also distinguishes anxiety from depression. People with depression don't typically experience those jittery, keyed up uh, sorts of things. Now, 
that's if we had a group of people who had just depression and no anxiety, and people who had anxiety and no depression. The truth is, these really are comorbid. They go together a lot. They co-occur a lot. People who have depression invariably also have anxiety. They're common to have social anxiety or uh, generalized anxiety or panic. Any of the anxiety disorders, they highly, highly comorbid. Depression, as we'll see now that we're talking about depression, um, throughout the rest of the semester, depression is highly comorbid with lots of different things. Very highly comorbid with eating disorders, which we'll get to. Very highly comorbid with substance abuse uh, disorders. Very high, highly comorbid with um, uh, some of the uh, childhood disorders. So it's very highly comorbid with lots of things, including anxiety. So you'll see this emotion uh, kind of profile of low positive affect in people with depression uh, if they don't also have corresponding anxiety. Uh, social anxiety is um, the one kind of exception to this. So people who have social anxiety also have lots of high negative affect, lots of anxiousness, nervousness, irritability, anger. They also, though, have some low positive affect. Um, it's one of the anxiety disorders that looks an awful lot like uh, depression. One of the cognitive factors that's studied in um, uh, depression is attributions, um, and a particular pattern of attributions. There's a measure called the attributional style questionnaire that you give to people with and without depression, and you can determine from their pattern of responses uh, the kinds of attributions they make about bad things in the world happening. So um, I got a parking ticket. So what do you attribute that? What caused that? Uh, I got a poor grade on a midterm. What, you know, so what do you attribute that? So what do you think caused that? So the three domains of attributions um, that you can unpack when you're thinking about somebody's style, the general manner in which they make attributions for negative life events, they could either be global or specific. Uh, they could either be stable or unstable, uh, or they could be internal or external. And I'll, I'll show you an example of what this might look like here. So here the bad event is um, an attribution of why I failed my GRE math exam. Um, so a global uh, and stable attribution for that would be I'm just dumb, I'm stupid. Um, so global meaning it's not specific to math. It, it, it transcends every possible domain you could think of to ask me about. I just don't have it. Um, and it's stable. It's not like um, it's going to change. It's not unstable. Like, uh, well, I had a bad day. I had cold. You know, so I just totally got it. Yeah, that would be an unstable attribution. But something that's stable. And in internal, you see the word I in all of these. So these are all examples of internal attributions. So um, if you see if they're global, stable, internal, those are all in, uh, looks like pink. Uh, that color, that's the attributional style that people with depression have. People uh, who have depression are more likely to make global, stable, and internal attributions um, for why bad things happen. So that up there, I lack intelligence. That's a global, stable, and internal attribution um, for why a bad thing happened, like doing poorly on the math theory. Um, but you can see here, uh, a more specific one was, well, I'm just bad at math, or an unstable one, I'm tired. Um, an unstable specific one, I'm just, I've had enough of math, I'm, I never want to do that again. Um, so um, I could have had another dimension here, an external attribution for something um, here, an external specific um, and unstable attribution for why you did poorly on a math test would be, well, it was Friday the 13th. No, I said that. So you know bad things happen on Friday the 13th, or it was cold, or you know, something you know, that's external to you, um, and pretty specific, um, but unstable, it's always Friday the 13th, you know, when you take a, a math period. So the style of making, when bad things happen in life, people with depression are much more likely to make these global, stable, and internal attributions. Um, now, there's some um, literature that suggests this is true while people are depressed, for sure. Um, the question is, when people are not depressed, let's say you've had a history of a depressing episode, you're no longer depressed. Um, do people who have a history of depression still show this style? Or is it something that's only there when people are depressed? And the evidence here is a little bit mixed. There's some evidence that suggests that um, people who have a history of depression will also show this style, um, but it's really strong when somebody is in the throes of depression. That's the evidence is strongest. So when somebody's feeling currently depressed, they have met diagnostic criteria of depression, they're more likely to make this attribution style. The evidence is more mixed as to whether or not this style persists even when somebody is no longer depressed. Another cognitive and very influential cognitive model of depression is, um, has been made by Beck, Aaron P. Beck. It goes by uh, Pim Beck. Um, and uh, this is sometimes referred to as um, a triad of uh, things. So people with depression um, feel poor, they feel negatively about themselves, they feel negatively about the world, and they feel negatively about the future. So I suck, the world we live in sucks, and it's not going to get any better in the future. That would be kind of the negative triad, feeling bad about yourself, the world, and the future. So that's a, a key part of, of Beck's model. These um, beliefs that people have about themselves, the world, and the future are all uh, negative. And then there, um, these kind of beliefs come from somewhere, and that's um, the role of a negative schema. Um, these are kind of underlying mechanisms in Beck's view, or um, kind of where these beliefs come from in the first place. Um, that uh, people have these very strongly held psychological beliefs um, that promote the idea that I'm worthless, the future's worthless, and the world is worthless. And then there are also uh, these cognitive biases um, or distortions uh, that people make uh, when it comes to um, their uh, thinking. Um, so um, here's just a, a couple of uh, these um, cognitive distortions. Um, and the book has a whole table, I think, of these with specific examples of these so that you can uh, look those up. But an overgeneralization, for example, that is, I'm just a, uh, I have no friends. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm destined to be alone in my life. I have no friends. So that would be a distortion, how, unless somebody didn't have any friends. But what you do as a therapist is that you say, well, wait a second, you don't have any friends. Okay, so what about your roommate? Well, they're not really my friend, they're my, you know, they're my roommate. They have to be nice to me. Okay, but you know, plenty of people have roommates who aren't nice to them. So what, you know, what's your definition of a friend? Well, you know, somebody you can hang out with and who listens to you. And well, I thought you told me that that's what your roommate does. You know, that you know, when you've had a really bad day, that you can really you know talk to your roommate about that. So that sounds kind of like a friend to me. Well, I guess okay, I have one friend. You know, my roommate. Uh, so you're kind of you know I'm you know doing this in a kind of caricature way. But what you do is in cognitive therapy is that you're gently pointing out to people these distortions and you're challenging some of these beliefs or these thoughts that people have. Like I'm uh, I'll, I'll never have any friends. Or I'm never going to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Or I'm destined to be alone. Or nobody uh, likes me. Or I'm a terrible parent. Um, you know, uh, and people make these kind of overgeneralizations, these big broad statements based on very few exemplars, and they ignore you know somebody says I'm a horrible parent. You know, because they just had an interaction you know where their three-year-old gave you know uh, had the tenth temper tantrum of the day and the parent you know shouted I'm a terrible parent. You know, I'm ruining my child's life. You know, they'll never, you know, get over this. Ignoring the fact that for the nine prior temper tantrums of the day, uh, that the parent was very, you know, accommodating and didn't shout and didn't lose um, uh, her temper uh, and, and lash out at the kid. Um, so these are just examples of overgeneralization. There's a whole table of these. So there's just a summary of what I just told you. So three kind of psychosocial or triggers for depression are uh, negative life events, having uh, low social support, interpersonal factors, and these uh, negative uh, cognitive styles. Um, so um, uh, that negative attributional style, feeling bad about yourself, the world, and the future uh, in Beck's um, view. So uh, worried about being rejected, not getting reassurance, and having just bad things happen to you. Um, all of these things are triggers for depression. Which raises the question, what about mania? So we've been talking about depression. So what about mania, which is really, remember, to meet the diagnostic criteria for bipolar 1 disorder, what you've got to have one uh, lifetime uh, history uh, episode in your history of mania. So those are what I just told you, negative
for major depressive disorder, those things are risk factors. It's just that mania has a, a different set of risk factors. And so what are they? The number one risk factor for mania is any change in sleep. Sleep is, uh, is really important. And so if someone with a history of mania, bipolar disorder, and had manic episode has any change in their sleep, and uh, usually that means sleeping less, or a disruption in the routine of sleep, um, so somebody all of a sudden has a new job uh, and they uh, all of a sudden are working the night shift, uh, that can be a risk factor. It's a change in sleep. Now you have sleep during the day and not at night. That can be a risk factor for uh, increasing the likelihood of uh, mania. A change in medication, we'll talk about treatment here in a minute, but um, usually that means um, stopping medication. A uh, huge risk factor for um, the development of a manic episode um, is people stop taking uh, their mood stabilizing medication. Uh, caffeine um, can actually be a trigger for some people, um, and drugs of abuse, uh, amphetamines, uh, alcohol, just using any kind of drug can increase the likelihood of triggering a manic episode. And then uh, increasing activity. Remember, that's one of our uh, symptoms now in DSM-5 for mania, having an elevated mood and um, increase in activity. So any inkling that somebody starts to get revved up and have a little bit more energy, a little bit more activity, maybe uh, taking on a few more things, you know, like, well, I've you know, got a 18 hours of classes, and I'm in four you know, extracurricular clubs, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to add that, and I'm going to start volunteering, and then I'm going to do an internet startup. Uh, you know, any increase in number of activities and energy um, is a risk factor for the development of uh, mania. Uh, not surprisingly, probably increases in activity are probably also correspond with a change in sleep. To actually pull that off, increasing activity and goal pursuit, like adding lots of new goals and pursuing those relentlessly, is going to correspond with a reduction in sleep. So she's saying, she's raising a question, so this is confusing because these, some, these things are the symptoms. Um, so uh, I'm having a hard time understanding what is a trigger and what is a symptom. And so it's a good question because these are, you're right, they are the symptoms. Um, the overactivity is a symptom. And uh, sleep, not needing much sleep, what, is the tr what distinguishes it from the symptom and the trigger is a change in your sleep. Um, so now you know, you're not overnight starting to sleep one hour, but there's been a disruption. You used to sleep 10 hours and you had a regular schedule. Now your schedule's off. You've shifted. So now that you're sleeping, you know, just six hours. And then the next night, uh, back to 10 hours. And then four hours. And then you've done it all nighter. Those kinds of changes in your sleep that aren't necessarily a symptom, but they can trigger uh, a new episode, that change in sleep. And the same thing with the activity, just any change in your activity. So you're doing lots of activities. Now all of a sudden, you're thinking, you know, I, I really would like to go after this goal. You really start to rev up your activity. So it's that shift. Um, that shift is kind of a, uh, a warning sign that uh, if we don't dial it back a little bit here, get back to regular sleeping or uh, get back to not doing quite as much activity, that could progress, that slight shift could project, progress to the severity of a symptom and then a full-blown manic episode. So you're, I, thank you for the question because it is confusing. And I don't know if that helps, but I hope it helps a little bit. So what do we do for treatment? This is a uh, table that's in the book um, here. So there's lots of different medication options, both for uh, major depression and for um, bipolar disorder. Um, the interesting um, thing for um, major depression is that people have like a genuine choice, really. Um, you can take uh, medication or uh, do a psychotherapy, particularly cognitive behavior therapy or interpersonal therapy, and they're both, both equally effective. Um, that's not true for mania. You really do, med medication is the first uh, line of treatment. So let me just walk you through a couple of these. So this would be the least likely uh, choice for medication for people with depression. It's uh, called an MAO inhibitor. The MAO stands for monoamine oxidase, in case um, you want to know. Uh, and what this, this particular um, enzyme does is it breaks down norepinephrine and serotonin. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, what this MAOI, this uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, also does is it breaks down other stuff besides norepinephrine and serotonin, which have been linked to uh, depression. Um, and uh, particularly, it breaks down um, something called tyranine, which is commonly found in lots of foods, wine, cheeses, other kinds of foods. And you need that, actually, um, because uh, tyranine helps us to uh, digest uh, these kinds of foods. And so if you're taking a, an MAOI uh, drug, you have to be on a very uh, particular diet, um, which is why this is the least likely uh, used type of medication um, for people with depression, because it comes with um, uh, a pretty uh, hefty um, limit on what you can eat. Um, you have to follow this diet, because if you don't um, follow this diet, you eat whatever you want, and you're taking one of these, the, uh, the most severe consequence could be death, um, which is pretty severe. Uh, so you, uh, you really have to monitor what you eat. So that you know, is, is too much um, for a lot of people. Used to be, there's another broad class of drug called tricyclic antidepressants. These used to be the most commonly um, prescribed medications. They're still used um, for depression today. Um, they, uh, they're, they're probably, uh, they're not the most common kind of depression uh, medication to use, though. Um, psychiatrists uh, will turn to these if the other uh, drugs, like SSRIs, uh, don't work. So just because these have um, a little bit more uh, side effects that are unpleasant that go with them, and they don't have quite the same uh, dosage um, variation that something like an SSRI does, so you can tinker around with the doses better with other medications, and the side effects are a little bit worse. But they're very effective, equally effective, really, to this next class of drugs, which is the SSRIs. Remember, these are the selective serotonergic uh, reuptake inhibitors. Um, these are the most common um, medications for depression. Uh, this would be uh, something like Prozac. Um, there are other kinds of medications um, that are used for depression that don't fit into um, any of these categories, either an SSRI, a tricyclic, or an MAO, because uh, they do a little bit of um, lots of stuff. Well, Buterin is probably uh, one of the more famous examples of this. It's not exactly an SSRI. It does do um, some work on blocking the reuptake of serotonin, but it also works in the dopamine system. Um, so so, but broadly speaking, these are the most commonly prescribed medications for um, depression, and they can be prescribed in very small dosages. Um, these are also, I should say, the most commonly prescribed psychoactive medication, any kind of psychiatric medication, um, period, um, more than uh, any other other. Lots of off-label uses for uh, these uh, antidepressant uh, medications. We've already talked about how antidepressants are sometimes used in a number of the anxiety disorders and in borderline personality disorders. So these are used um, a lot. Um, there are other sorts of uh, biological treatments that aren't medication that can be used for uh, treating major depression. Uh, one of the more controversial ones is uh, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy here. Um, so uh, made famous or infamous, I should probably say, from uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, a book by uh, Ken Casey, um, and turned famously into a movie where uh, Jack Nicholson um, played uh, Randall P. McMurphy, if anybody hasn't seen that movie, it's a, it's a good movie showing kind of, uh, I think, sadly pretty accurately, the state of psychiatric hospitals in the 1960s and the misuse of uh, ECT. Um, so uh, ECT is still used today. Um, uh, it's just done in a much more careful um, and less uh, barbaric way um, where there's a single that, uh, electrode that's placed, a current uh, is passed um, through these uh, electrodes, and uh, people, what it does is it induces a small seizure. Um, and uh, people are given like a mild uh, sedative um, 